is football shut down for 2020. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, along with my Ohio State colleagues here, uh, come to you uh, each and every week with Ohio State football talk. We got Kevin Noon on the line from Buckeye Grove on Rivals and uh, hope to get Tony Gerdeman back and Steve Hellwagon as well. Kevin, it's all up to you. I can handle it. You know, to heck with those other two. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be a much better show this week. I believe our 44th edition could be our best with just just Kevin. <laughs> so I'll serve it up. Uh, Ryan Day hit the podium the other day, uh, and you guys took that in. Uh, what what stands out from the football moratorium right now in Buckeye land? Yeah, I don't know if, he's at a, if he has a podium at home. It was a good conference call, I guess. According to sports information, there were about 50 media members on it. Um, no, they're having to deal with you know the same situation that everybody across you know, across the country, probably across the world, is dealing with now of just having to keep distance and whatnot. Um, talked about some of the challenges and plans in place to be able to deal with you know coaching a team of by the time you put walk-ons and everything else in, well over 105 guys who are at various parts of the country. I mean, you have guys like Enoch Viamahi that's uh, in Hawaii. A lot of guys in California. Jack Miller, that's in Arizona. So, you know, you have a lot of marching orders in place of what, you know, what they're supposed to do and and and, and whatnot. Uh, somebody brought up a question about accountability, and obviously accountability is very important at this point. But, uh, you know, maybe at some places I hear that they're like having players take pictures of what they're eating and whatnot because there's not a nutritionist in place to, you know, monitor what's going on. And Ryan was like, you know, if we have to go to that level of, of just sitting on top of these guys, we don't have much of a team anyway. So, you know, I think there's a there's a good measure of having a veteran team and having leaders like that that can be able to to work with their position groups and, and whatnot. We also did learn that a couple of players are still in the dorms. Uh, that's just not a student athlete situation. That's a university thing. If, you know, if a player is from uh, – a hot zone right now for where the coronavirus is. They could they could get a waiver. Uh, Master Teague, who is not necessarily from a hot zone, he's uh, from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. But he uh, you know had the Achilles injury. He's able to, he was able to get a waiver. He's staying on there. He's getting his uh, rehab done over at the Crane Athletic uh, Facility over there off of uh, Ackerman on campus. So you know we we got to learn a lot of things. I mean a lot more stuff too on on about a forty five minute call with Ryan Day. So I would like uh, Steve and Tony to know that uh, we promised everyone the best Ohio State Buckeyes live ever with Kevin Noon exclusively, and then you mm. two showed up. It's all gone to heck now. Sorry to ruin the party. <laughs> the, the average star rating of this class just went way down. It really did. Yeah. Well stated, Tony. Well stated. All right, Steve, well, we can continue with you. So uh, as Kevin let us know, uh, Ryan Day – uh, had a conference call this week uh, to address the media and some of the concerns and some of the, the the obvious challenges and maybe some of the not so obvious challenges of the situation in trying to get his football team ready and just make everybody uh, keep everybody safe, but uh, make sure that uh, they are working toward a 2020 football season. So what did you take from all of that, Steve? Yeah, I take it that uh, they're doing the best that they can to stay on top of all the logistics involved in uh, micromanaging the lives of 100 uh, college kids who are spread all across the country. Um, obviously, these guys are back taking online classes uh, right now. <clears throat> Coach Day talked about how they're under an eight-hour rule right now because uh, this is not considered a spring practice time. Uh, now because obviously they've they've put that aside so they are limited in how much interaction they can actually have uh, with the players uh, at this time or ask them to to do for football activities I guess at this time to eight hours a week but still I think it's imperative that, and what we're going to find out is uh, which athletes which teams took this uh, the most seriously uh, when uh, it resumes uh, whether it will be uh, May 1st, June 1st, July 1st, at some time in the future, uh, you hope that they're able to get back to some kind of uh, normalized on-campus uh, activity. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded it's March 27th, I think, to, to write off the idea at this early stage that there'll be a season 
just yet seems a bit premature. I think there's still plenty of time to uh, to, to uh, hopefully uh, put this thing, uh, however you would say it, I wouldn't say behind us, but at least neutralize it uh, the best that we can and uh, go from there. So uh, I think uh, everybody is continuing to, to uh, push forward with the idea that there will be a season in some form. And uh, part of that is uh, continuing individually to, uh, to prepare for it. Steve hit on a uh, topic that we'll get to in regards to it just being here in the last few days that I've heard from several sources, uh, fairly legitimate people actually talking about there being no season. So Tony, in regards to Ryan Day's approach, uh, what stood out to you? Um, I think the most interesting thing is the way they have to personalize all of their workouts with, um, so many players, as they said, we've got, you've got players in Hawaii, California, Texas, downtown New York city and how, uh, every, every house, every situation is different. Not everybody has a basement uh, gym. Some guys, I assume, and I wrote this the other day are probably lifting with paint cans and, who knows what else? I, I compared it to the um, Apollo 13, where there was an issue in the capsule, and, and NASA had to work, you know, offsite using only what would be found in the cat the, the capsule to to fix the issue. So I assume, uh, like strength coach Mickey Marotti and his staff are getting got info from each player, like what do you have in your house, and then they have to build a workout around that and send videos in on how to uh get get that workout done i also thought it was interesting how they said that they're not you know some coaches may be monitoring everything players are doing via fitbit or requiring players to send in video of workouts being done he said they're not doing that because of the care rules which uh, steve mentioned and also that if they have to basically keep track of every single thing players are doing then they're not as good as they thought they were. They're not as disciplined as they thought they were. The culture at Ohio State isn't what they thought it was. And so he's putting a lot of trust in the players, but also the players' families. He's got mom and dad riding the players, making sure they're getting their stuff done. Coaches are checking in with them all the time, but they're not uh, you know, monitoring with uh, satellite imagery every, every mo movement of the players. Was it brought up at all in regards to – what Ryan Day and his coaching staff believe to be the shortest period of time in which they could reasonably uh, get ready, get their team ready for a full season. Yeah, he said it was a good question, and he didn't know. That that's fair. Yeah, yeah I mean, and he did kind of talk about. I mean, if the question was brought up about doing something along the lines of OTAs, if we get back to you know we get back to football activities and whatnot, and he did go back to how it used to be that. There wasn't necessarily the, the, the summer, the early summer uh, get-togethers and doing things along those po points. They would just get there and they would just hit the deck running. And, you know, maybe that's not optimal or whatnot, but we're not that far removed from it. Um, a lot of things in terms of how long it's going to take to get a team ready is going to depend if they're going to have time to, to phase things in and not immediately be in pads and out there hitting on day one or whatnot. But uh uh, he said that conversations and studies would need to, to take place, you know, those famous Urban Meyer studies that we heard a lot about through the years. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, and I know we're going to get to it in a little bit, I think any talk of uh, scuttling the season here, not even 15 days into really the heavy weeds of this is is, is grossly premature. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, bringing you Buckeye talk each and every week. And the only way we can do so is to bring in this panel of experts, which includes Kevin Noon right next to me. Top right there, Kevin Noon from uh, Rivals Buckeye Grove. You got Steve Hellwagon, who so graciously posts these on uh, Bucknuts 247 Sports, senior Big Ten writer there. Tony Gerdeman from theozone.net. So, yeah, we are in a situation in which late March spring practice wiped out uh, summer drills, individual workouts. Maybe there's some loosening of or merging of summer and spring practice and the individual workouts become more of a, a, a shortened team activity sometime in June. And then they take a break and then they come back. Uh, there's obviously a number of 
of ways to configure this. But uh, considering all that's put into, and I think I mentioned this last week, and I haven't worked out the hours, or and I'm not a football coach that's hypersensitive to the time needed to prepare these athletes, but uh, I don't think we're anywhere close. Now, now time is, is running, and, and of course, we will get to a point uh, in which this, and it won't be too far into the distance where we get to start crunching numbers and calendars and weeks and so forth. So, uh, so I think the day's coming and not that far away, but for the time being, I think there's plenty of time to prepare football teams, especially when everybody's playing on the same footing uh, for a full, full football season that starts, I believe for everybody uh, except for a few teams that last a couple of days of August for everybody else, the first Saturday of September. So I think we're in decent shape there at this point. But uh, there's been a few media members out there that have uh, uh, already gone to that uh, point. And I don't know if they're playing medical expert at the same time and logistics expert in addition to their their football acumen and, and so forth and surveying the situation. Because this takes more than a football analyst to survey the situation and determine at this point when most of even the experts are saying, What's going to happen? We talk in weeks. We talk in months. Well, we'll have to see that the next couple of weeks are going to be critical in seeing how the numbers either continue to ascend or hopefully flatten out and start to subside. Well, and Ryan Day said he was asking about the possibility of the season being shortened or ended, and he said he's not going to. That's it's wasted time to even think about that. So they're moving forward, preparing. But like you said, Mark. Here in Ohio, they're saying the peak will hit in mid mid April to early May, and we'll see what that looks like. I when we talked to Gene Smith, I two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I don't even know anymore. Uh, I asked him about the possibility of the season being canceled, and he said they weren't even able to look that far into the future yet. Now, a lot has happened since then. Um, I, I don't know how much more will happen because things moved really quickly in that two week period where big 10 tournament was canceled. Conference tournaments were canceled. The NCAA tournament was canceled. Things have been pretty well shut down. So I don't know what else will come go into it now, but I, I wonder, you know, are they starting? I assume they're starting to look further into the future, but I'm with Kevin. There's, there's so much we don't know yet on how long this thing is going to be. Um, and, for me, I'd like to stay positive that there's going to be a season, and when things when things present themselves, saying, "Well, that's probably not going to happen," then I'll be like, "Well, what about a half a season? What what about a quarter of a season? You know, just give us something." Well, things are changing daily. I mean, multiple times a day, we're seeing numbers revised and moved around, and you know, I'm not going to get into you know, the, the, the political side of things or whatnot. But I, I just think that we're having so many discussions about, well, we know this is going to happen and this is going to happen. No, we don't. We don't know what is going to happen. I mean, we have, you know, the best medical minds out there working on, on this and they're not necessarily in consent. They, there's not a consensus among them about what the situation is. And while I do think you do want to have a plan in case, things don't go right. You know, you don't want to be caught off guard. So I don't think it's irresponsible to be, you know, on the, on the planning level for the NC2A to maybe be talking about some things like this, but I think it is, it is so early to be thinking about it. We're, we're not even to April one at this point. And let's say that states, you know, most states, every state is different. Obviously what's happening in New York state is different than what's happening in Montana, you know, so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if we're going to be reaching this peak in on May 1 or whatnot, and then there's the downward slope. I mean, I don't I don't think if we're sitting here, if we're at June 1 and they're like, OK, I think we're, we're starting to get a handle on this. We found some, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're 12 to 18 months away, probably still from a, from a vaccine, but there's still going to be some, you know, some some relief and treatments out there. I, I, I don't see i don't really believe that we're going to be looking at a year with with no football could we see impacted maybe could we see scenarios of where there are limitations as to how many people we're putting in stadiums and and whatnot i guess i mean granted we 
we went through this whole point of where all these conference tournaments and basketball were going to happen. And then within 24 hours, we went from going as planned, limited fans, no fans, nothing. So, I mean, I, I think we're going to see similar things happening on this point. Anything that we're talking about here on, on March 27th is going to seem like a million years ago by April 4th. So, so, Kevin, you hit on something that's uh, interesting on two different levels, one being player uh, freedom and then the other one being the institutional freedom based on the way this might be brought back in sectors. I think they quadrants is the term that was used in the last couple of days in regards to there are hot spots in the country, uh, unfortunately, and then there are other places where uh, the impact has been more less minimal, more minimal. Um, so if, if the, if the players themselves are allowed and, and freed up in some cases, but in other cases, they're in a restricted portion of the country, uh, then as long as there's air travel, you can, you can bring them onto campus. You could do that, but then it brings the situation where there could be advantages and disadvantages to at what point is the institution up and running therefore the football program up and running in certain parts of the country and not other parts of the country and that possible uh, uneven playing field. Very good questions. I mean, things that, I mean, I don't think any of us necessarily have any answers for. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it'll be, obviously when we see one in four cases and I mean, this, these are based off of numbers that I saw on, on Thursday, one in four cases in the country are New York city, obviously places like Rutgers and whatnot are, are, you know, in much more risk than, you know, Boise state is, I, you know, I keep picking on that part of the country, but there's nothing, you know, there's not a lot going on. Their population density is not big. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just know that I'm, I'm preparing for business as usual to resume here at some point. Um, I was, you know, I was hopeful May 1, you know, the last couple of uh, state of Ohio addresses we've had maybe is, has, has tampered down my expectations a little bit. Maybe it's going to be a little bit later than that, but uh, you know, we got the, we got the best and brightest working on this and, you know, we'll get through it. And, and as soon as Kevin mentions Rutgers and football moratorium, everybody out there can can fill in their own blank of a, a joke there. I'm not going to go there because of the seriousness of the situation, but uh, certainly there are a no number of uh, analogies that can be drawn there. Well, they finally got a coach. They got a coach, and he's won in the past. Yep. He has won in the past there, uh, not necessarily in this situation in the Big Ten. Uh, we did our Rutgers schedule preview this week, and um, yeah, the the numbers and the the uh, the layout of the the competitiveness of that program over the last several years is you guys know what the deal is. Twenty one straight in the Big Ten, seven and forty five since they joined the league in the Big Ten. Uh, so it's not looking too good, but uh, they got the guy in place who's done it before. You know, I think things are actually looking up at Rutgers because I saw. Michigan just got a, a commitment from a New Jersey defensive end who didn't even have a Rutgers offer. So uh, <laughs> right now it seems like the Scarlet Knights and Greg Schiano are recruiting at a higher level than Michigan. I'm not going to touch the old boy. Number 1127. It was a four-digit ranking, I think. The rare four-digit ranking kid. Diamond in the rough. I say. Speaking of recruiting – Travion Henderson's going to make an announcement tonight, I hear, at 7 o'clock, based on what I see in the live chat and also looked up online. Is he doing it on ESPN as well? Is this how <laughs> SportsCenter is, is filling their time now? Might as well at this Might point. Uh, don't make us wait until like 11 o'clock like they did with uh, Seth Towns the other night. Make us stay up all night waiting for Seth Towns to come at. There you have it. What, <laughs> what was once, uh, you know... A slow news day uh, is now a permanent slow news day for the time being. So uh, do we have any prognostications out there? I know you guys aren't recruiting guys necessarily, but you're all over it in regards to when I say recruiting guys, I mean the guys that do it full time all the time. You guys are obviously uh, in the top one half of one percent when it comes to staying on top of the recruiting landscape as well. But uh is there legit hope that he's going to make a, a Buckeye commitment? 
I don't I don't like wasting my time generally at seven o'clock I'll be paying attention and that's <laughs> all I'll say on that one. Yeah, okay. I think everybody expects him to be a buckeye. Oh, they're okay. First uh, five star I, commitment since uh at running back since uh Beanie, if we're not counting Jalen Gill. Wow. Uh, uh, that sounds sounds right. You say so. And then there's still people wanting to know, well, can they get Edwards too? Can they get Edwards mm -hmm. too, but keep him away from Michigan? And I'm like, just calm down. <laughs> just be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Exactly. They can't get everyone. The, the, That's the, right. You know, not well, everyone not only do they want to get everyone, they also want to play defensive recruiting too and keep players away from, from their biggest rivals. Well, maybe they should try and get – Donovan Edwards instead, so he doesn't go to Michigan, and then you know, and then if Travion Henderson ends up going to UVA or UNC or whatever, that's not a big deal because when are we ever going to see them? Go out and get the players that you want, and you know, if you have if you have the guys, it really doesn't matter who your opponent has. That is and, right. you, and, and Travion Henderson, if you've seen his film, is is really 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 good. So as much as you know, maybe maybe some Buckeye fans would rather have. Edwards just to keep him away from Michigan. When was the last time a Michigan running back hurt the Buckeyes whose last name wasn't Bianca Batuka or Howard? Yeah, that would pretty much be it. Uh, that's uh, the recent history. Uh, that kid in 2003, what was his name? Uh, Perry. Perry. Chris he Perry. Had yeah. a pretty nice. Chris Perry. Chris Perry. Yeah, 2003 hit a pretty nice day against the Buckeyes, and that was the last meaningful Michigan win if you look outside the rivalry. Uh, as something that really mattered in the series that went the Maize and Blues way. Ballard Sports Media with Nick Bosa and Chase Young gone. I think Bosa was gone a little sooner than that. But anyway, gone at the edge position. I am curious what that looks like for 2020 and can the replacements live up to how great Young and Bosa were? Zach Harrison, Tyreek, <laughs> Devontae, Jean Baptiste, Tyler Friday. Um, Jonathan yeah, Cooper. I mean, you just it's like how it is every year in college football, you just don't know. I mean, freshmen become sophomores and sophomores become juniors. I mean, you know, Joey Bosa wasn't really Joey Bosa until about midway through his freshman year, he really turned it on. So, uh, you know, I, I think you have to trust in Larry Johnson and Mickey Marotti that they're bringing the guys around along the way that they should and that uh, they're going to be just as good or if not uh, as good as a team defensively as they've been in years past, they were outstanding last year. So to me, um, I don't worry too much about one position or one player, but uh, I think that, uh, that within the team framework, they're going to be pretty good. And Zach Harrison last year as a freshman had pretty much the same stats as Chase Young as a freshman not too far off from what Nick Bosa had as a freshman. So he's tracking well, and, you know, we all know the kind of physical freak he is, and he got a start last year. He's one of what, five or six defensive ends to actually get a start last year for the Buckeyes because of injuries. And so there's a number of guys. I, I don't even know if we mentioned Tyler Friday or Noah Noah Potter. So there's, there's, there's guys there. Baron Browning is going to probably do some rush end stuff. Maybe not not unlike Josh Uche at Michigan last year, where he's listed as a strong side linebacker, but he did his most work as a, as a pass rusher. And just to clean up the numbers on Travion Henderson for Buckeye fans out there that don't follow the recruiting, just watch the games. Second rated running back according to two four seven, number three according to Rivals, top seventeen player according to two four seven, and uh, Kevin, uh, it's only the sixty fifth rated player according to your outfit there so him so you think good enough. we know we, we know all ohio state commits get dropped as soon as they get <laughs> guys we we know that the guy averaged 12 yards of carry last year noon come on <laughs> okay i'm sorry I'll, I'll 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 go to the table with that pound on it but Thank they don't you. listen to me <laughs> yeah and for anybody out there that really understands the numbers and how many the masses uh, of uh, recruits that come in, number 65 in the nation. That's a rarefied air. So regardless, 1765, it's like razor close between the two. Uh, David Greenshield, appreciate uh, you jumping on board here. David uh, supports us on a regular basis. 
mentions here about Lorenzo Styles. Man, as soon as I saw the name Lorenzo Styles, I thought, what, uh, number 90? What? Mm -hmm. Number yep. 90. Yeah, number 90, 90, I believe. Renzo Styles, uh, early 90s, uh, 92 to uh, maybe 91 to 94 would be my guess on his years. There was need a to get more linebackers linebacker. in the 90s. Late first round pick. Mm -hmm. Cleveland uh, Browns, I believe. No, that was Craig Wait. Powell. Styles, I believe, was a third oh, or fourth to the Falcons. Yeah, Craig Powell. Yes. He played with the Rams, too. That's why I hit <laughs> you guys around to straighten me out. Uh, yeah, they, uh, number 77 overall. Mm -hmm. That's I just right, him Lorenzo on Styles to the Falcons. Yeah. All right. So anyway, David Greenshield asking about the the Lorenzo Styles, who uh, of course is the next generation, who I see as a top twenty wide receiver according to regardless of your your service there. Who's looking at Notre Dame, Ohio State? Seem to be the crystal ball predictions right now. Uh, four star out of uh, Pickerington. Who who's seen him? Likes him? has any kind of evaluation there. I can answer the question about the recruiting. I mean, he just uh, – Ohio State definitely did recruit him, but when you look at in-state guys, I mean, you you have to sit there. When you when you go all in on one, you better be ready to accept him at that spot. I'm not saying Ohio State wasn't ready at that point, but uh, Lorenzo Styles came off the board pretty quickly with, uh, with, with, with Notre Dame, and I think a lot of uh, recruiting guys were kind of shocked with how quickly that one happened. Um, Ohio State certainly has not had an issue here in the last couple of years of recruiting the position, but, I mean, it was a player that they definitely liked and definitely would have liked to have on the team, and just it just didn't happen. But, I mean, he's a tremendous player. I mean, obviously we've seen a lot of talent come out of Pickerington. I live in Pickerington, by the way, but I mean, a lot of talent come out of Pickerington here through the years with the, with the Borens and, you know, just go on. I mean, I can name a lot of names here. Uh, you know, guys that get away, Taco Charlton who went to Michigan and whatnot. Um, but you know, it was not a case of Ohio state taking an in-state kid for granted. They, they definitely, uh, were, were very involved in this recruitment, but, uh, you know, Styles Jr. Just decided to go, uh, you know, go in a different direction. Tyree, yeah, I think yeah. just, just, go just ahead, a case Dave. that he was predisposed to go to Notre Dame. And uh, as Kevin said, uh, they did a good job of getting in on him early. I'm not sure what the family ties would have been. And you think about Lorenzo Styles, he played for John Cooper, who was three head coaches ago at Ohio State. And uh, again, pro career elsewhere, came back uh, here to town, has actually spent the, the dad actually spent uh, time as a kid in, in the Columbus area, but uh, was, I think, um, from uh, Western Pennsylvania when he signed with Ohio State. So he bounced around quite a bit. And, um, you know, again, um, not sure exactly how to explain it, but, uh, you know, Notre Dame was, was, I guess, first at the party for him, and uh, that was good enough for him. The Rod Farva asking about Tyreek Johnson, uh, highly, highly rated uh, safety athlete uh, was his uh, category coming out of uh, Trinity Christian Academy in the 2018 class uh, coming into his junior season for the Buckeyes. So what's the story on Tyreek Johnson? Uh, just a guy who has not been able to get on the field yet, and there's been plenty of corners in front of him. That's where he's been playing. I wonder if, if he gets passed up by some of the freshmen this year is it time to move him to safety Tr try to find somewhere to play him slot safety i don't know he's he's big and he's long as a as a corner kind of similar to sean wade in that regard because they were teammates at trinity um but really has not been able to be what they expected and we'll see like this is this would have been a big spring for him to show that he was ready and, and with Kerry combs coming back i mean this is his third cornerbacks coach at Ohio State, which I think it doesn't help anybody when you're going through a new coach every single year. And we'll see, but there's, I mean, they need they need him to step up because they're pretty thin at the spot. And we'll see. Um, you know, he's one of the many guys they're counting on. Marcus Williamson is another, who's a, what, a senior now from IMG, but originally from Westerville. And um, that guy has to play and, uh, the freshmen are going to get a chance because they're talented as well. And 
with one starting guy returning at corner and Sean Wade, they're going to throw everybody against the wall and see who sticks. And I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people are betting on Johnson right now. We uh, we don't get very many opportunities to go to practice. They're kind of few and far between in the spring and, and uh, even in the fall. And I can't recall a single time in, in the last two years where we have gone to practice and Tyreek Johnson – has been on the field practicing. He's usually over on the side working out if he's there. Uh, obviously, that changed with the first day of spring ball this year. He was number 13 was on the field and he was practicing. It was one of the few times in his two plus years or two full years he's been on campus that I can recall that he was healthy and available. I mean, from the very first time he arrived, it wasn't very long after that that he was on the shelf, and he's pretty much stayed there for a year and a half. So <clears throat> when you haven't practiced much or if at all in, in almost two full years, it's kind of hard to make any kind of an impression. He was a big-time prospect, uh, maybe a borderline five-star, if not a five-star in that uh, class from, I guess it would have been 2018 would have been his first year. And a um, lot of promise and still plenty of time in his college career, three full years of eligibility remaining. But, you know, it's like a lot of guys, you know, you, you, the moving sidewalk is ending. Please look down because, you know, if you don't, uh, you don't take advantage of the opportunities you get. And Marcus Williamson's another example of that. Maybe he didn't take advantage of some opportunities earlier, earlier in his career and has been passed by, by and large. Well, now, Given everything that's happened, Okuda and Arnett was a senior, but Okuda leaving, uh, Reap and Went not available, uh, and so on. You know, maybe Williamson is a guy that uh, suddenly gets a look. He he really hasn't played a whole lot other than special teams as well. So, you know, they're going to try everything. As uh, Tony said, they're going to put a lot of these guys in the in the blender and see who uh, can make plays on a consistent basis. I was very impressed again, just one day with seven banks. He just looks like an athlete who uh, belongs. And uh, he made a couple plays on the ball the day that we were there, which seemed instinctual, seemed athletic. And I think you got to be excited that he's going to fill one of those cornerback spots. And then uh, from there, it's pretty wide open. I think uh, for who else is going to play in the secondary, but uh, yeah, I think got to be excited about it to uh, have Kerry Combs there. They're going to uh, identify who can play, coach him up, and get him ready to go. See, I forgot all about Tyreek Johnson, but it's uh, it's coming back to me. Second rated safety in the country, fifth rated prospect out of Florida, top twenty player in the nation. Wow, yeah, but, he was, I mean, uh, keep he was in a mind, big big recruit. Like and Malik I don't Hooker. know that he's even played it down yet. As you yeah. guys, did, did he even get on the field as a red shirt freshman? I don't think he did. I would have to look. But, you know, Malik Hooker, I, he was a backup as a second-year player but didn't really become something until his third year. Marshawn Lattimore, Gary Ann Conley, all of these guys, their third year is where they really took off. And, you know, maybe that's the case for Tyreek Johnson as well. Yeah, it says here he played in six games and had two tackles last year. So that got by me. I, I didn't see it, but uh, six games and had two tackles. You missed those two tackles? No clue. I assume Rutgers and Rutgers, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm pulling, I'm or going, Miami, Ohio and Miami, Ohio. I'm going to PFF right now and trying to look at their shot, their shot sheet. But I, I, I do think Cameron Brown and Seven Banks are going to be just fine with Sean Wade at corner. Those two guys have been playing quite a bit. Uh, I think they both played like six or seven games as, as true freshmen, and then they were all out there last year because of the injuries. that you know, There are just so many injuries last year. Uh, I think uh, Banks even got a start last year. Cameron Brown came in when somebody got ejected. Uh, so they've, they've played quite a bit, and I think they'll be fine. They are Ohio State corners, so there is an expectation, and – uh, there's no reason to think they won't meet it, even though neither of those guys are super highly ranked. But, um, you know, they've done fine with guys they like before. PFF has them playing 57 snaps in over the course of six games. Uh, three games where he saw double-digit snaps. Uh, Northwestern, 
uh, Rutgers and Maryland. So it I was, played six snaps against Rutgers. Ex- exactly. I mean, it was not high leverage, uh, high leverage situations that he was out there. They were all Big Ten games. Well, we got 80 on the line here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and this is what you need to do. So we talk Ohio State football each and every week, and I hope everybody out there appreciates the contribution we get from Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, Kevin Noon from Buckeye Grove, Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts. Give us an hour plus of their time each and every week to talk Ohio State football because of the schedules flying back and forth, maybe not necessarily these days, but on a regular basis. We can't lock down on a specific day and time. Therefore, you subscribe to the channel right here. You get the notifications of when we're going live. We've got 82 on the line. Uh, Tim Foster, thank you so much for the uh, Super Chat contribution. I will get that to the screen, but I appreciate that so much. So this is what I alluded to last week. The comment made by first uh, Ellie, then by Yardvark's Lawn Care in return. Um, I believe there's a sediment out there. Uh, that because Ryan Day walked in and, and went undefeated and lost one game total, that what Urban Meyer did is pretty easy to do. Ryan Day is going to eclipse that so easily. And people forget quickly. And since that national championship came early in the tenure, and then there was just this expe- expectation of, and I can understand it. Uh, he won two at Florida, then he comes to Ohio State undefeated, national championship two years later. Uh, he's going to win four or five of these. And so then pretty much everything after that to the to the unreasonable fan became like, ah, well, we missed the playoff. We only won the Big Ten. Uh, we only went uh, 13 and one this year and finished number four. Um, we didn't win the national championship, basically national championship or bust. And boom, Ryan Day. And there's a there's a thought that uh, the Clemson game, we outplayed them. So. Uh, actually we could have won the national championship this year and this is only year one and this is what it's going to be all the time. And that 91% winning percentage of Urban Meyer, ah, he'll be able to eclipse that with no problem. Uh, Over time, I don't think people understand when you win 91% of your games, you never have an off year. You can't have an off year and win 91% of your games. Uh, So there's no nine and three sprinkled in there. And if Ryan Day sticks around long enough, he could do a tremendous job as we all expect him to. But don't be surprised if there's a nine and three once in a while. But I I just think that's the sentiment out there from a ton of people that, you know, and and I think everybody's going to have to beat them. I mean, somebody's going to have to rise up. Who's 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 putting themselves in a position to do it? Uh, Michigan and their and their and their four digit recruits. I mean, I don't, you know, God bless them, but I don't know. Um, Michigan State just had to make a coaching change, and that's gonna that things are gonna be a little, uh, as Steve likes to say, a little hinky up there for a while with that. Uh, Penn State. I mean, you know, they they've come close. I mean, I I have to say they're the number two team in the conference, and then you go to the West. I mean, obviously, Wisconsin, you know, reloads and kind of does what they do. And, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I, – I, I'm not sitting there and saying that Ohio State is going to, under Ryan Day, win 91, 92, 93% of its games at, at all points. But, you know, what what is, what is Dabo Swinney's legacy right now at this point if he were in a conference that actually had a pulse? Uh, and, you know, they're running over the ACC and – they're, yes, they have put together some of the best recruiting classes that I have seen in a long time through the through the years. I'm not going to take anything away from them, but it, you know, for Ohio State to go nine and three, three teams are going to have to beat them. And I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening here in the in 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 the in the near future. Well, to reference the list we talked about last week of the top 150 coaches of all time, and I went back to that, Dabo Sweeney is a good 15 to 20 spots ahead of Urban Meyer, and that was prior to this last season. Well, wow. he did beat Urban. So. No, no no comment on that list. Right. I'm just hoping they were having a bad day when they put that together because it was laughable at best. Uh, thanks so much for uh, reminding everyone to hit the like button. We appreciate it. And subscribe here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Steve Hellwagon, Kevin Noon, Tony Gerdeman. Please check out their work. Tony's at the Ozone. Kevin at Buckeye Grove. Steve, of course, at Bucknuts. What are you guys working on these days? Cleaning my office. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. 
historical features, trying to get people on the telephone to talk about different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, we did have that teleconference with Coach Day, and we're trying to come up with stories based on that and different things. And, you know, uh, I did a rundown uh, Big Ten spring football, even though we didn't have spring football for the East Division and the West Division. And as I looked at it, um, uh, Wisconsin is is pretty much, again, I would think the, the favorite in the West, although uh, Minnesota is going to be pretty good, but their game was going to be played at Wisconsin. And Wisconsin went into Minnesota this past year and smacked them pretty good. Um Getting back on that idea about Ohio State having a down year or whatever, you know, Iowa was a pretty good team this past year. They were nine and three and they lost three games by single digits. I think two points to Wisconsin. Uh, they uh, lost at Penn State, I believe, and there was another one, maybe a couple points at Michigan or something like that. And exactly, yeah, people, people kind of uh, disregarded uh, Iowa. But then they got into the bowl game, and, and USC had won five of its last six games down the stretch, and they made them look like a fourth-grade team in the bowl game. So um, in some regards, I think that speaks to how good the Big Ten was. I think it speaks, um, you know, whatever, however you want to put it. But uh, it shows, again, that the difference between great, 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 great very good and good, sometimes the, the difference in some of those levels is very close. And Iowa, to me, I don't think they were great, 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 but they were very good to great and lose three games by on one play each, essentially. And uh, people look at them and say, oh, you were 10-3. and three. That was kind of a you know a crap year or whatever. I don't really view it that way. And the same thing could happen to Ohio State maybe some year where maybe they're breaking in a new quarterback or they have bad spate of injury or they only have two guys coming back on their defense because a bunch of guys have gone pro. You know, however you want to put it, it could happen. But then you think about how dominant Ohio State was. Was Penn State 11 points the closest game that they played the whole season going into uh, – the uh, the bowl game, and obviously they trailed Wisconsin by 14 points at halftime, but came back and won that game by 13. Um, you know, they they really didn't give anybody an opening to beat them, other than Wisconsin in that uh, championship game, which they played a, a second half of football that uh, was among you know the best two quarters they played the entire season, and they had to they had to play like their hair was on fire at that point because. The season was on on the line, but uh, I guess it just kind of you only get beat if you when you're this good if you open the door to get beat, and we've seen that you know in the past with you know Iowa, Purdue, and and Penn State back in uh, 2016, but those times seem to be uh, pretty rare. And uh, you know if they don't beat themselves, I mean who who can beat them? I, I'm not sure anybody can. It's on a roll. There's no question about that. I'm just looking at the um, the the probabilities over a long tenure at Ohio State and oh, trying yeah. to keep up a yeah. 91% winning percentage is is pretty is pretty difficult. Don't be well, and, I don't know. And when Urban Meyer stepped down, everybody was like, you know, don't expect Brian Day to like if like I think what I said is as long as Brian Day can keep it between Urban Meyer and Trestle, he'll be fine. You know and now it's like, yeah, well, as long as Ryan Day can keep it between Urban Meyer and you know whatever you know, Nick Saban, yes. yeah, <laughs> then it'll be fine. If he starts to fall below really Urban Meyer, maybe maybe sit him down and have a talk with him. <laughs> like Ryan, your winning percentage is now eighty nine percent. We need to talk about this. We're not happy about this. We're That's three losses Meyer. now in two years. This is not acceptable. And then, of course, by that point, we're all, it's going to be an 18 playoff anyway. So you can lose two, you know, you can go into a playoffs with two losses and then lose a third. Maybe that's how Ohio State ends up with three losses in the season moving forward. There it is. I think uh, we're good to go for an Ohio State Buckeyes live. Tony Gerdman from the Ozone. Please check out his work as well as Kevin Noon on Buckeye Grove. And of course, Steve Hellwagon from Bucknuts, senior Big Ten writer. 
right there. Guys, appreciate you stopping by. I never take for granted that you guys have a zillion things going on. Maybe not necessarily this uh, portion of the year, but uh, it'll it'll come back at some point, and hopefully we'll have football fully in 2020. Yes. Yes. Kevin, we need one from you. That might be the tipping point. Okay. And um, and we'll be good to go. But uh, appreciate uh, you guys uh, each and every week um, delivering your insight and uh, expertise. So we hopefully can uh, reconvene next week. We'll see what we can do. Oh, Maybe we'll be at practice. Too busy. Who, who knows? <laughs> there you go. We got Miami talk coming up in a few minutes, folks. So keep it right here. All right, fellas.